Hello and welcome to our weekly look inside Syria. I'm Mike Hanna. It's been a week of military gains by the opposition and diplomatic manoeuvring. On Tuesday, rebel fighters said they'd captured the city of Al Raqqa. This would be one of the most significant gains by the opposition after two years of fighting. The city sits on the north bank of the Euphrates River, about 160 kilometers east of Aleppo. And this could yet turn out to be a major turning point in the course of the uprising. On Wednesday, Arab foreign ministers meeting in Cairo offered the Syrian opposition coalition a seat at the Arab League, but on one critical condition, that it first form a representative executive council. Meanwhile, Britain said it's sending more support to opposition forces in Syria. Foreign Secretary William Hague said the UK will supply the fighters with armoured vehicles. The move has been criticised by the Syrian government. The political and media adviser to President Bashar al-Assad, Bhutani Shaban, told reporters in India's capital, New Delhi, she's surprised that Britain is providing assistance to the rebels. She maintains the equipment would help al-Qaeda and other fundamentalist groups that exist within the Syrian opposition. On the same day, though, armed fighters in Syria detained 21 UN peacekeepers in the volatile Golan Heights region. The Filipino soldiers were taken by a group claiming to be the opposition Martyrs of Yamuk Brigades, and a spokesman accused the UN of cooperating with the Syrian regime. Several groups, including the Philippines government and the United Nations, were involved in negotiating the peacekeepers' release. To discuss all of this, we're joined by our guests. In Washington, D.C., Joseph Holliday, a senior research analyst for the Institute for the Study of War. In Jeddah, Hisham Mawa, a member of the Legal Commission of the Syrian National Council, and he's also a member of the Syrian National Coalition. In Paris, Lawai al Mokdad, the political and media coordinator for the Free Syrian Army. And here in the studio, I'm joined by Mohammed Bassam Imadi, member of the Syrian National Coalition. Mr. Imadi is also a former member of the Syrian National Council and the former Syrian ambassador to Sweden. Welcome to you all. Let's begin with Lawe al Makdad. Regardless of the circumstances involving the UN peacekeepers, to what extent does this situation highlight the difficulties of command and control and lines of authority uh, with groups, uh, rebel groups in the field? Good evening. Actually, this is uh, the situation now. It appears that the Free Syrian Army has nothing to do with this situation. Uh, all the all the problem that we tried to evacuate this uh, soldiers, the Philippine soldier, and the situation now it's it's appeared that uh, it's not it's not our uh, problem or it's not our uh, the regime who's tried to kill those uh, people and he's trying very hard to chill uh, chilling and uh, and he used the MIG and the Sohoi air jets and also he sent his tanks inside this area and as we know all this area is uh, after uh, 1973 uh, it's like offline zone and you can't get any weapons inside this is what uh, the arrangement between the regime and Israel so today we saw the tanks it's uh, 50 meters from the border from Ajolan. so how Bashar al-Assad he do that we don't know he chilled every area he followed the, uh, the soldiers from house to house he followed the UN soldiers from house to house by chilling. And you will hear uh, their witnesses. They are the eyewitnesses. And we talked to them. You will hear those soldiers, the, the UN soldiers. And they said that the regime, he tried to kill them directly. He tried to chilling, uh, chilling all the area. He used uh, some uh, air missiles to kill them. So I think now the situation is better and it will be uh, finished by now. Well, Mohammed Bassam Imadi, though, the, the situation that we are looking at here is a degree of confusion, a degree of um, difficulty in terms of establishing exactly what is happening. How great a problem is this uh, for fighting against the regime? Well, actually, we are used to all those uh, maneuvers by the regime, killing somebody and then accusing the rebels uh, and the Free Syrian Army. And because the plan of the regime from the very beginning is to prove uh, that there are gangs and there are terrorists in Syria. He, uh, you know, the, the regime and the people in, uh, in the regime have done their best in order to distort the image of the revolutionaries inside Syria. So what Mr. Baghdad is saying is very clear that those people were going to be killed. 
uh, by the regimes and, and, and the Free Syrian Army, or the group which is uh, helping them now to go out, is doing, uh, their, are doing their best in order to move them safely to the border. Now, um, I believe that we should uh, wait and see, because judging the, the matter before it's clear, it's, it's really doing a great service to the regime. I mean, I know the emotions of the people. People think that those soldiers are being captured by, by, by the rebels and they are now under bad circumstances and so on. So I, I advise everybody to, to keep calm and wait until we see. And it seems it's going to be very soon, the end of the whole thing. Well, Joseph Holliday in Washington, D.C., that initial question that I was putting of just this as an example of the difficulties of creating some kind of information flu flow between those in the field and those who are attempting to control them or to observe what is happening on the ground. Well, I think with this, uh, first of all, we don't know much about the Armouk Martyrs Brigade. Uh, they haven't been one of the uh, known rebel units, one of the known uh, affiliates of the Free Syrian Army. Uh, we are assessing at this point that uh, they're a Palestinian militant group uh, based on uh, the name Yarmouk. It's the largest refugee Palestinian population in, in Syria. It's a neighborhood in Damascus. And at this point in time, uh, our assessment is, is basically that they uh, got backed up against the Golan Heights there. Uh, they were trying to use that area to avoid uh, regime uh, offensives. And when they got pressed by the regime, as was described a moment ago, uh, they wound up uh, capturing some of these UN peacekeepers to try to get themselves out of that jam. But I think the issue here, as you've, as you've pointed out, is that the new Supreme Military Command, while it, it brings together most of the key rebel units across Syria, it doesn't have direct lines of communication with all of the different militant groups in the country. And that's something that's going to take a great deal of time and effort for the opposition to build uh, going forward. Well, Hishamawa and uh, Jeddah, your, your opinion about this, the difficulty of actually dealing with all these various disparate elements on, on the ground inside Syria and, of course, outside. You know, uh, I really uh, agree 100 percent with Mr. Imadi uh, about what he, uh, what he advised regarding to wait and to keep calm until uh, we receive uh, clear information. We still have a question, how these uh, peacekeepers, uh, you know, found out of the, uh, I mean, the area between there, uh, between Israel and Syria, there is certain area should be uh, in no soldiers, I mean, the soldiers should not be leave it, uh, other, uh, as well as uh, why uh, the regime has his tanks and his uh, arms there, uh, while uh, there, there is it prohibited according to uh, convention of uh, 1973. Uh, so uh, just, you know, I um, uh, uh, recommend to uh, calm down to, uh, and wait until we receive uh, clear uh, information uh, from, uh, about the situation. I hope to hear good news soon. But just to take a look at the various issues that we have in terms of the various forces and factions that make up the Free Syrian Army and indeed the whole Syrian opposition, let's take a look at this one particular case. In December, the U.S. declared the group known as the Al-Nusra Front a terrorist organization, effectively excluding the powerful group of opposition fighters from any formal unity moves. The group came to prominence a year ago when it claimed responsibility for a suicide bombing on police buses in Damascus that killed 26 people. Some have linked the fighters to gunmen who used Syria as a route in and out of Iraq during the war there. Our Nusra leaders themselves have admitted to recruiting fighters from Saudi Arabia, Pakistan and Lebanon, as well as Britain and France. Western diplomats have been keen to keep Al Nusra separate from the Free Syrian Army, but on the ground there are reports that its fighters have been deployed in support of FSA groups on a number of occasions. But this would seem to play into the hands of those who maintain the opposition movement is in danger of being taken over by those who have religious rather than nationalist uh, motives. To what extent is this an issue, do you believe, um, uh, Hishan Mawa? 
you know uh, what you did say about uh, all the uh, f uh, i mean the, the fighters there f f you know against the regime in syria really the uh, just sus i mean just uh, ideas about what they are doing what they are looking for we are not sure about their program for syria according to what they used to say they are uh, ready to leave syria once the regime falls down and the problem will be finished as well as they could not know i mean uh, f uh, control the country they are you know not that big uh, front in Syria, and uh, Syrian people will not accept any new regime uh, except what comes through uh, the election. So the vote will be, uh, I mean, voting and uh, election will be only the way, I mean, for the Syrian future. So we are not afraid about uh, what they are doing because they, as I said, they are now fighting against uh, the, the uh, regime and uh, they did not do anything against, uh, I mean, the law uh, and uh, just they uh, try to support, uh, um, to do uh, liberation or aberration against the regime. So we can't say you are a criminal and you are doing to do uh, bad things until we are sure about that. We can't judge the intentions, as you know. Well, Mohammed Basim Mahdi, on this particular issue, um, to what extent are you concerned that once there is no common enemy anymore after the regime has fallen, that you are then going to, to deal with the fallout from particular groups who are not necessarily operating under the guidance or the overall control of the umbrella uh, organizations that are running the campaign against uh, al-Assad? Um, let's not simplify the matter. I mean, let's discuss it as it is. We know that in Syria there are many groups fighting not because they don't want to unite, but because it's impossible to unite. You know that the regime has been in control of many places in, in the country, but, and, and the people had to fight in different areas, in pockets here and there. And there was no way to unify those people because of the shelling and the regime uh, uh, divisions and, and military uh, fighting them. So, in fact, what happened was those people took uh, control of certain areas and uh, took uh, good positions there and now it's not so easy to bring them together there are so many attempts to bring them together now this is one thing another thing is what is called now those uh, uh, movements which are not in, this, uh, in the in the middle of, of, of the fighting but they are on the extreme side of, of the fighting you call them extremists or others call them other names but these people are mostly Syrians. The group of Nasra itself is in, in large, uh, to large extent, uh, those people are Syrians. There are some foreigners, but the number is very marginal in that uh, front. They might have in mind uh, Islamic uh, ideas, but I don't think that they will have so much effect as, as some media perhaps like to say or other countries would like to, to, to say. But uh, at the end of the day, when there is no common enemy, I think Syrians are ca will be ca capable of, of doing the job for themselves. And this is one thing we have been talking about a long time ago. We said, please, don't let this thing uh, go for a long time, because the consequences of letting it go, in, go for a long time would be worse than interfering and ending it uh, as soon as possible. Well, we'll talk about the length of and the duration of this conflict, but Joseph Holliday, I want you to pick up on that point of a group like al-Nusra, the danger of uh, uh, taking away from the legitimacy, one may put it, of the struggle to oppose the al-Assad regime. Well, the interesting thing about Jabhat Nusra in particular is that we do know that they are uh, closely uh, related, at least at their core, to al-Qaeda in Iraq. But they've learned from some of the things that al-Qaeda in Iraq did uh, that wound up uh, leading to their defeat. Namely, Jabhat Nusra has moved away from any types of attacks against, you know, car bombing attacks against civilian populations. And they're focusing on conventional infantry operations against the regime. And they're also focusing on humanitarian aid provision, basically, and, and providing services in the areas in, in northern Syria. The issue with this, the issue with Jabhat Nusra and why the United States ultimately designated um, that organization is, is it ideological uh, because Jabhat Nusra believes in uh, a, a global Islamic caliphate. And I think that's an issue. There's lots of other Islamist groups uh, among the opposition inside Syria, but they're ultimately nationalists. And I think that's the important place to draw the line.
Well, uh, hello, I, I'll mock out your opinion of this, the uh, difficulties that might be presented by groups not operating necessarily under the same uh, or according to the same agenda that uh, you and the Free Syrian Army may wish to follow. Let me be clear on this point. As, as Mr. Imadi said, that we are now two years asking about help. We ask all the, the countries that we need help. We went to the Arab League, the, the uh, uh, United Council. So we, 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 we spent uh, two years now. We are losing blood, we are getting killed, and we are asking to get help. So after two years now, we feel, and, and to be exact, at the, the last week that we try to feel that the international community, he, he start to get, uh, uh, to be more serious with the dealing with the Syrian revolution and the Syrian people. As we saw three days ago in Brussels, and now today we are in, in Paris, we said that the Britain, the uh, French, the Americans, they tried, they want to make us more organized and stronger on the ground. When we said from the start that if you will leave the Free Syrian Army without support, without help, in, as least with the logistical equipment and with some hardware also with some weapons, with, there will be not on, there will be extremist group on the ground because they have their own sources to funds and they have their own sources to, to uh, networks, money networks and that will be dangerous on all the uh, Middle East area. That's what, and this is the game what Bashar al-Assad played from the start to make us appear like we are gangs and we are extremist group Today, they promised us and they start actually, to be clear also, they start to help us and to organize ourselves and to make us stronger. If the Free Syrian Army will be stronger, at least you will have guarantee for the future of Syria and the future of all the uh, Middle East that no, no extremist group will not get control on the uh, countries or will not will be li like long uh, battles uh, between the Syrians or civil war or other situation. What we want today for sure, what we want, we want a serious uh, uh, a serious uh, steps from the international community starting by united states of course and uh, as we heard that when we was in bruxelles with general salim idris the americans they said that uh, general idris will be invited with mr muaz al-khatib to meet uh, president obama soon maybe in a uh, few days or one week they will be there and they said that they will start to send us some aids and some military equipment to organize our ourselves to get Bashar al-Assad down and also to control the situation on Syria to not leave Syria to be destroyed or to be civil war or to make all the the Middle East area destroyed as Bashar al-Assad promised us he promised us if you will remove me if we will get this dictator uh, out of Syria they will be uh, the, all the Middle East will be in the in difficult situation we don't want that to be we want to make, build a civil country we want to build our democracy in Syria we want to see uh, our election and our people living as always as 7,000 years ago from our age as Syrian uh, living peacefully with all the people and living uh, in our way well let's just take a look at the wider political ramifications as well um, Syria's main opposition group says it will be uh, a new provisional prime minister on Tuesday that's after former Premier Riyad Hijab, who defected last year, withdrew his candidacy. Hijab has faced some challenges from Syrian National Coalition members because of his previous ties to the Assad government. But this would appear to be part of the attempt to form an executive council in accordance with the Arab League condition uh, that there does need to be some umbrella body taking control of the Syrian resistance movement. Um, Hisham Mawa in Jeddah. Is this the first step in creating this type of national executive council of the Syrian opposition? You know, well, first of all, let us uh, separate between two matters. Uh, the, you know, the executive board, which, is, uh, which uh, had been mentioned in the resolution 139 of uh, Arab League, uh, this is one matter. Uh, the other matter is the temporary uh, government. Uh, two separate matters. When we, uh, I mean, decide to, as a coalition, to elect uh, prime minister, to appoint a prime minister, to, I mean, form his uh, uh, government and to come back to us to uh, get the trust of, uh, from the, the, uh, this uh, coalition, this is another matter. But when uh, Arab League, uh, you know, said uh, uh, coalition uh, should b should uh, form uh, a board, uh, executive board to occupy or to, to keep control, to take control of the Syrian seats in uh, Arab League. Uh, so uh, now, uh, the, uh, as I said, uh, they are two separate matters. Uh, uh, as coalition, we have two missions. First of all, to, I mean, to, uh, b to, to form our uh, executive board to be ready to occupy the Syrian uh, 
uh, seat in, in uh, Arab League and its uh, uh, organization. Uh, uh, and as well as we are uh, discussing, uh, we, uh, we have to discuss in uh, next week uh, meeting uh, if we uh, decide to appoint uh, uh, or to elect actually uh, a, a prime minister to start uh, to I mean to work on his uh, uh, his home his homework to, to, to I mean to find his uh, ministers and to be ready for uh, control the, the liberated uh, area. So uh, our the seat of uh, the uh, Syria in Arab League uh, it's uh, just based on uh, the coalition and it's uh, I mean uh, it's a board uh, executive board to occupy such Syria uh, such seat not it is not a condition uh, according to the I mean to the resolution there is no conditional uh, I mean situation asking uh, coalition to I mean have temporary government to be ready to uh, I mean to occupy uh, such uh, the seat no uh, they uh, just in the paragraph two they said I mean the, 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 the resolution states clearly form uh, coalition Syrian uh, coalition should form executive board to occupy the Syrian seat. It uh, doesn't mention, uh, it didn't mention any, uh, any, any, min, any uh, I mean, single word, single letter about temporary government. Temporary government is another and separate matter. In, indeed, yes, but if I could come to Mohammed Bassam Imadi here, um, how important is it though to create this type of body to establish some form of overall control that can be looked at by the international community in general as the people who are in charge? It's absolutely important, very important to, elect, to, to appoint an executive body because what we see in the coalition is a kind of parliament rather than an executive body. And that's why there has been so much co uh, focus, uh, I don't want to use the word pressure, on the coalition to, to do that. And they have not been able to do that. And I don't think that they will do that in the near future because only last week the spokesman of the coalition said we are going to meet on Tuesday but not necessarily to appoint a prime minister uh, of the government. Now there are also, not only the coalition, but there are so many conditions conditions on the ground, uh, on the m money front, on other fronts that do not really facilitate uh, appointing a government. I mean, if you say that we have a government inside Syria, who's going to protect it? Until now, we don't have enough missiles to, to, to defend ourselves. Uh, let alone the civilians who are being killed every day, there are no means to defend those people. How can a government sit inside Syria without proper protection? How can they do their work? How can, where is the money coming from? What means of, of authority do they have on the, over the Free Syrian Army or over the local councils that have taken place? So uh, in, my, in my opinion, there will be no uh, interim government, nor temporary government, nor any government soon. Uh, unfortunately, I, I mean, I would very much like to see something like that coming, but it's not, not really in the, in the, in the horizon. Well, Joseph Holliday, you heard all the problems that do face uh, the Sir, uh, Syrian opposition in forming some kind of centralized authority. Uh, but how important do you think it is that some form of body is formed to accept accountability for the opposition movement? The Syrian revolution has, from the beginning, uh, really developed from the ground up. And to me, the most important thing for the Syrian National Coalition to be able to maintain its legitimacy is the ability to provide resources to the people on the ground who are fighting Assad and living inside Syria. So that means both providing uh, money and weapons to the opposition that's fighting Assad, and it means providing humanitarian aid to the people that are living in the areas that the rebels control right now. And there's elements of the Syrian uh, National Coalition that are doing this. The humanitarian aid unit has, has been increasingly effective at getting uh, that, you know, that resources to the ground. But this conflict has become resource driven. And I, as much as it's significant to create an executive body in order to uh, get the buy-in from the international community that can actually increase the resource flows the end state here, and the only way that the Syrian National Coalition can, can eventually become the government of Syria, is by maintaining buy-in from the people fighting on the ground through the ability to provide them with resources. And one of the things that I just want to add here is uh, the last gentleman discussed uh, the issue of protecting the areas of northern Syria uh, where the Assad regime has been uh, using uh, its air force and recently uh, ballistic missiles, Scud missiles, to engage uh, civilian populations up there. The rebels have for months been actually able to prevent the regime's ground forces from reaching those parts of the country. But 
the northern parts of Syria and, and eastern parts of Syria are still within reach of, of Assad's air power and, and Scud missiles. And so this is, this is an important step to be able to protect those areas to allow uh, you know, a true government to move in and, and take, take shape. Well, so many problems on both the battlefield and, of course, the diplomatic front. At that point, thanks to my guests in Washington, D.C., Joseph Holliday, in Jeddah, Hisham Mawa, and in Paris, Lawai Amakdad, and here in the studio, Mohammed Bassam Imadi. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. And thank you for joining us. Remember, Al Jazeera has extensive coverage of what's going on in Syria, not just on this program, but in our On the Hour news bulletins and online at aljazeera.com. I'm Mike Hanna. Goodbye for now.